Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt, hope you're having a wonderful day and I really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. We are learning about naval aviation today and we are looking at the F-18 but unfortunately we're not discussing the naval F-18 fighter jet today. We are discussing something just as important as the flight launched fighter jet of the US naval fleet. Early warning systems and today the E-2 Hawkeye. Now, I have a huge respect for aircraft carriers, their crews, the flight crews, everyone who works alongside them. They're such a game-changing military asset to have in worldwide capability for the military. However, as much as I respect the fighter jets that get buzzed off the flight decks to engage targets around the world, they would be useless without the information provided for early warning systems such as the E-2 Hawkeye. Now, in the 33 years since the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the US Navy has scrambled after an effective airborne early warning system to detect distant low-flying enemy or just about anything else out there that could pose threat to the fleet or the aircraft carriers. The first early warning platforms were planes like the 1E Sky Raider or the EC-121 Super Constellation and the E-1B Tracer. But the finest pedigree for all of the US Naval Fleet was the E-2 Hawkeye A, B and C variants. One risk the Navy was very concerned with in the early days of modern aircraft carriers was low-flying high-speed aircraft that could attack the fleet without detection since most shipboard radar were actually suited to more high altitude threats. One key attribute that we can look upon in history in regards to low-flying aircraft destroying fleets is the Falkland Islands and the Argentinians taking huge effect in engaging ships in harbour. At long distance in the sea though, these ships could still be at risk if aircraft were flying at low level. The first early warning data transmissions were actually only done by voice intercepts and were severely limited. There was poor detection over the sea and none over the land that could work with most US naval fleets effectively. The E-2 Hawkeye series serves carrier battle groups, specifically the United States Navy, and is called upon as an all-weather airborne command and control battle space management system. The Hawkeye became operational in 1964 and has been around for some time, replacing the aging E-1 Tracer series. This was the principal early warning aircraft in service with the US Navy and another Grumman design, though based on the S-2 Tracker anti-submarine aircraft. At this time, the future of the E-2 series is in service with the United States Navy it appears very safe as a program as it's constantly being developed for new challenges of waging air wars over the ocean. The system is also fielded by several other US friendly nations. The aircraft was first flown in 1960. The Hawkeye was designed to provide that airborne early warning or AEW for the US Navy's carriers. By 1968, the E-2 was equipped with the Doppler radar and has been the eye in the sky for the Navy for more than the 30 years that it's been in service. This all-weather, carrier-based platform features a 24-foot radome that revolves at 6 RPM, and it retracts 24 inches for carrier stowage. The three system operator crewmen and highly specialized electronic equipment can simultaneously search, identify, and track more than 6 million cubic miles of airspace and hundreds of targets at any one time. Of course, this was not originally the case when the aircraft first came into service. It needed a lot of upgrades. One of the shining moments for the Hawkeyes was when they were directed with F-14 Tomcat fighters flying combat air patrols during two carrier battle group joint strike efforts against terrorist-related Libyan targets in 1986. E-2Cs and Aegis cruisers working together provided total air mass superiority over the American fleet. More recently, E-2Cs provided the command and control for successful operations during the Persian Gulf War directing both land attack and combat air patrol missions over Iraq and providing control of the shootdown of two Iraqi MiG-21 aircraft by carrier-based F-A-18s in the early days of the war. E-2 aircraft have also worked extremely effectively with US law enforcement agencies in drug interdictions along with the Coast Guard. Now she may be old but she's still doing exactly what she needs to do. The more senior variant, the E-2C, became operational in 1973. In 1999, the US Navy awarded Northrop Grumman a $1.3 billion contract to build 21 E-2C Hawkeye 2000s. An additional $1.9 billion was given in 2003 for the System Development and Demonstration or SSD of the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye. The Hawkeye built by Grumman was the first airborne tactical data system designed for carrier operations specifically, with advanced radar automatic computers and better communication for the entire US fleet. 
Which is kind of ironic, because even some of the most modern fleet carriers of today are relying upon systems that are integrated to an aircraft that's almost 33 years old. The information that is available on this aircraft is very automatic and less intervention from the crew on board, and can be requested by any asset in the sky or on the sea. This allowed carrier-based command posts with communication via the E-2s to direct friendly aircraft and pinpoint enemy planes far away from the fleet before they even knew they were there. Linked with the Fleet Task Force, tactical data systems allow the early warning system Hawkeyes to project a huge picture, and a specific instance of this was during the Vietnam War. Basically, all of Vietnam was able to be mapped out from these aircraft. There were 59 Hawkeyes delivered to the Navy in 1967, but it soon became evident that the plane needed a lot more flexibility. The Charlie model was first funded for development in 1968, and at the same time, special purpose computers on the E2 Alpha, or the original platform, was being replaced with the general unit and drum memory, which was replaced by programmable add-on core memories. These modified E2 Alphas were designated the E2Bs in December 1971. The E2C carried five crewmen, a pilot, a co-pilot in the forward portion of the plane, and a combat information center officer, an air control officer, and a flight technician in the fully pressurized cabin in the rear. Although another officer can substitute for the flight technician, the latter functions as a master repairman for the sophisticated electronic gear in the back. Although the pressurized cabin is mask-free environment, the naval flight officers continue to wear their bulky flight gear and remain strapped to the heavy parachutes that are integrated directly into their seats. Fortunately, their workstations feature metal trays that slide out to expose keyboards and built-in trackballs. The closed quarters also allow naval flight officers to pass notes, communicate actually by hand signals, and when things get really crazy, even operate each other's equipment if someone wants to go down. The Hawkeye team can identify and classify radar emissions to correlate passive detection information and other electronic countermeasures for target classification. This data is transmitted by an extremely secure data link to the Carrier Task Force Commander for display and decision. Every carrier air wing includes four Hawkeye squadrons. Typically, an E-2 is the first airplane to launch and the last to land in the fleet, which is ironic considering that it is the most vulnerable and the most critical asset to the entire fleet. For a classic airborne early warning mission, it takes up station high above the fleet. Now, the Hawkeye is dwarfed by the larger big brother of the US Air Force's Boeing E3 Sentry, which you can go check out if you want to, as I have recently just done a video on this aircraft too. It performs in a similar function though, albeit a much larger crew. Because the E2 has to fit on an aircraft carrier, the Hawkeye's wingspan tops out at 80 feet and 7 inches. Over the years, E-2s have been fitted with several generations of T-56 turboprop engines, originally built by Allison and now by Rolls-Royce. The Hawkeye 2000 is equipped with a pair of T-56 Alpha 427 engines rated at 5,100 shaft horsepower apiece. With the new engines, the E-2C and D can cruise on station for more than 4 hours at up to 200 miles from its original home plate or aircraft carrier. Until recently, the E-2's engine sported a wicked four-blade prop, which generated a huge racket, and imagine an unmuffled Harley-Davidson running through a stack of Marshall amps. The noise and destructive power of the props made the E-2 a fearsome presence on the flight deck and inspired the nickname from many crews on the deck as the Hummer. Now fitted with fuel-efficient eight-blade props that are gentler on the E-2 airframes and, more importantly, the crew's ears, the airplane sounds more like a giant swarm of supersized bees. But of course, the biggest asset on this aircraft is the immensely powerful Lockheed Martin AN-APS-145 radar, which is capable of tracking more than 2,000 targets simultaneously and controlling the interception of 40 hostile targets, either towards its own airspace or the fleets. One radar sweep covers 6 million cubic miles. It's capable of detecting aircraft at ranges of up to 550 kilometers allowing it to give the fleet plenty of advance notice for threats or advance notice to engage. Because the E-2 was originally designed for seagoing missions, its radar does have trouble filtering out clutter on land and objects skimming over the ground, such as cruise missiles and helicopters. To enhance the Hawkeye's flexibility, Northrop Grumman is developing the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye. This has the APY-9 radar system that dramatically improves the clutter rejection while expanding search volume of up to 250%. Also, unlike the current antenna, which scans 360 degrees every 10 seconds, the new one can pause to lock onto targets, which will provide the radar operators even more information to digest. 
To spread the workload, the new design gives the co-pilot a scope of his own, which he can participate in the E2's tactical mission when he's not helping fly the airplane. The Hawkeye, of course, was not designed for close air support, but time and time again during the fighting in the Gulf, ground troops advanced so rapidly that they passed beyond the radio contact within the units they were supposed to to coordinate the close air support for them. Earlier on in the Iraq War, E2s were pressed into a stopgap role as the airborne communication relays between ground forces and the US Army's air support. But because the battleground was so fluid and so many airplanes had to be rerouted so quickly, Hawkeyes were given more latitude to pair warfighters with targets. The next generation E2D Advanced Hawkeye has the new radar system installed as of today. This also allows for theater missile defense capabilities, multi-sensor integration, and the Northrop Grumman Navigation Systems tactical glass cockpit. Lockheed Martin Maritime Systems and sensors developed the ANAPY-9 solid-state electronically steered UHF radar under the E2C radar modernization program. The Advanced Hawkeye replaces all 75 United States Navy E2C aircraft. The aircraft began full system development and demonstration in August 2003, and in July 2007, Northrop Grumman was awarded the pilot production contract for three aircraft for delivery in 2010. Officially, the E2D was rolled out in May 2007, making its maiden flight in August of that year. It's safe to say with the modernized E2D Hawkeyes that there is a huge game-changing capability of early warning capability for all of the fleets of the US. There is so much information to pass on in the modern battlefield and in the modern airspace, and with this kind of aircraft flying around, it allows for massive links between fleet to fleet. Of course, with interchangeable navies, there is also the communication between them too. These basically can create a huge network hub which spans huge amounts of the ocean to pass on information accurately and effectively to allow fleets that need to combine their efforts to either defend or engage against hostile targets or missions that are high priority. The difficulty with an airplane of this type is that the airframe itself is still quite old. You can upgrade as much as you want, but sooner or later when you put an aircraft under so much strain, especially on an aircraft carrier where it's being catapulted off, it does put a lot of tension on the superstructure of this aircraft. It's safe to say that the aircraft that has been upgraded to the E2D variant will stay around for some time, but it's really hard to say when this aircraft will be eventually replaced. It's doing exactly what it needs to do, and I don't see this coming across as a new aircraft in the near future anytime soon. Definitely not in, in my lifetime. There is so much money that has been pumped into this aircraft that I don't think we're going to see it disappear. And honestly, I don't want it to. It's doing what it needs to do, and those beautiful turboprop engines just look and sound absolutely gorgeous. Anyway, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video and learning something about the E-2 Hawkeye, a fantastic little aircraft that is doing so much for the Navy, not only in the United States, but around the world, and providing huge amounts of information that could potentially either save a fleet or connect to some extremely important missions. If you did enjoy today's video, I would strongly encourage you to hit that little like button. It really does help me out. Also, if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, please go click the little bell by the subscribe button. You can also become a member of my channel if you want to be uh, getting some extra perks and features. You can go click on the uh, join or join member button that's also there by uh, my channel uh, description box there. Also, if you want to uh, support my Patreon or PayPal, please uh, feel free to go check out my description box also. And I'd like to thank every single one of you who has been supporting my channel in one way or another with donations or just stopping by and watching the video. Thank you for being here and thank you for your support towards me and my YouTube journey. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.